Howdy do, Pickathon fam. Producer Evan here. Just wanted to let you know at the top that Zale's audio this time is a little bit off. He was away on business, and so we didn't have all the special equipment that we get to use, you know, in studio and stuff like that. So please bear with it because it's an awesome interview. This is really, really fun. Ryan Kaiser is an amazing musician. So yeah, just want to let you know it's not going to be all the razzle dazzle that you're used to. But the content is, I'll tell you what. So, anyway, thanks. Here's your episode with Yacht Club. Hello, Universe. Welcome to Pickathon Podcast, episode 12. I am your host, Zell Schoenborn. I'm the founder of the Pickathon Music Festival. And this is a podcast where we try to discover stuff and go to places that, you know, we don't really expect. It's kind of like a mini adventure at the end. Hopefully you walk away going, that's pretty cool. So wish us luck. Today, my guest is Brian Kaiser, who is of the well-known band Yacht Club that we'll kind of get into and has the distinction, I think, of being one of the, the largest bands in terms of streaming numbers that Pickathon has ever had before they played the festival, several bands that are kind of like in that world now. But you know, what's so interesting about um, when hopefully talking to Ryan is our world is kind of similar and our stories are similar. There's this whole it, a very unusual story of being an independent artist, like, and, and how you actually make it in the world. And like Pickathon is truly one of the only major independent festivals in the country. There's really a couple companies, I won't pick on them, but there's, they own everything. And the whole world is, is like that. And so festivals are kind of really tough. And like, when we think about being kind of independent, it wasn't like a choice. Like we didn't have like people knocking on our door to make, you know, give us money. We just like, oh, we want to put on a festival. And we said, so we got some friends together. And forever we were like 200 people. And for a while that 200 people started kind of like, we kind of started actually getting bigger bands and, you know, our journey to becoming kind of like a top 10 festival, we like to play it on TV. We're not really that at all. Like we're considered that. So hopefully when we talk to Ryan here, we'll like have that conversation, but the, the real parallels are kind of spooky. We kind of got to this point and you would say, Oh God, I want to do that. I want to have a, I want to have a festival. And I, I just like, like to warn people, like what, what this journey is like for some people, some people it's fast and some people, you know, it's kind of awesome when it happens in spurts. Like when we accidentally had the Avid Brothers back in 2006, all of a sudden we were like a discovery festival. We're bringing like the big national bands to the universe that were not known before. And so that, that's always kind of been our like jive. Like we wanted to kind of think of um, what's the essence of music, argue with friends, drinking beer, play booze ball, whatever. And like that was how we could do it every single year. Like that whole idea you know, if you're doing something like us, so like something like Ryan, you know, just beware. Like that, you know, the negative things here for us are just like it's risky. Like you don't never, you can't actually go out with a goal saying, "Oh, we're going to be successful." Like, but you can have and wish and want that and like fight like hell. The tricky thing is, is if you don't put the passions out front and like do it the hardest you want to be, it'll never happen. But it doesn't mean it'll ever happen <laughs> if you do it. So it's just kind of brutal and I had a day job for 18 years pretty much actually I even was on consulting doing my own day job till this year so like 23 of the 24 years of the of the festival I wasn't even doing the festival as like a job because it couldn't be that and anything we made we had to like put back in or sometimes we lost money and it was just like this crazy struggle and it's just like slow growing. That's either like going to kill you or it isn't like when you kind of get to that point, you know, what's the positives the whole time it's been like, okay, you get to follow your, your passion. You get to take chances. You get to kind of like, just not really have pressure. Like somebody's kind of corporate review goal that you need to be this, you need to hit these goals. And you know, that kind of like can kill something like Pickathon or I think Yacht Club is if you just superimpose like, oh, you need to hit these benchmarks. And what you get out of that is something kind of beautiful. And, you know, for us, we made so many irrational choices. 
We're Experiential Music Festival. And we always say it for the folks that have never been to Picketon, you literally won't understand. You probably have been to a million festivals. Ask your friends, try to get somebody to describe it, but you just won't get it. You got to come because it just won't make any sense. It's completely irrational. We have 10x too few people. Like we should have like 50,000. We have room for that. We only have like 5,000 paid. We have that almost that many people on staff and on crew, like almost 3,500 to 5,000. And that's dumb. You should have like 10%. You couldn't be picket on without all the people that helped build it. And just having kind of bands that no one's have heard of, that seems really like a dumb business model. But those bands go on to win Grammys. They go on to like play stadiums and they totally are on the year end best list of the people that go and often like critic lists. And like, so it's, again, we're just like picking the most amazing music that we know. You know, we can go on and on, like just things that we chose because we're passionate about it. We're independent and we didn't have to kind of like conform and do things in a parking lot with a fence and try to make it this or that because we just didn't, we wouldn't do this. This is why we were doing it. It's kind of turned into a job. And I think that's kind of interesting here to parallel as Yacht Club. I'm guessing Ryan also had the same kind of experience. But yeah, I mean, we didn't start it off. I mean, we would have dreamed that, but we couldn't get there. And we certainly didn't make those kind of like super quick choices to get there. You know, other rational thing is we have like almost 500 to 800 people on a film crew making beautiful content for the artists because we want like all this music to kind of bend pop culture it's not quite paying for it you know it's gotten close to paying for itself before covid kind of fell apart after covid but we're still committed to that and our kind of idea is like let's let's like infuse pop culture through this content and keep the festival kind of pure i don't know if that's going to be a successful thing but we're still into that and we still think that like to leave a mark to kind of like make all this amazing music last and kind of be captured in its essence is like super important to us. All of that said, you know, is it worth it? Well, after 24 years and we're here and we're kind of making it like a job now and people are starting to kind of, we kind of hopefully have a path. I would say, yes, do it, but uh, go into it with like a crazy clear mind. Cause if you're an artist in any ways, it could be fast. It could not be. And I wish you luck. <laughs> so with that, let me uh, introduce my guest, Ryan Kaiser. How you doing, Ryan? Doing good. It's good to be here. <laughs> good. So. I know we were gonna get into that part of the story, but I love I always love to back up because I think it's fun to start at the beginning. Where did you grow up? Where was you where was your home home base? Uh I grew up right outside of uh Jackson, Mississippi in Madison. And uh yeah, I grew up my whole life in Mississippi. I went to school in Mississippi and graduated and I lived in Nashville for two years. Uh I wanted to move away from home, but it was still too similar to home. So I moved to New York uh, last year, oh, and that's where man. I'm at now. So, I mean, yeah. it's a small town. Like I, we, we probably grew up, I grew up in a little suburb right outside of Cincinnati called Fort Mitchell. It's like a total suburb. Like, I'm sure okay. when you were, you, you grew up outside of like, like in Madison, is that like a suburb of Jackson or where is that? Yeah. It's a suburb. People up here, especially, or people I meet in California, are always so curious. They're like, "Oh, you grew up in Mississippi. Were you like out in a creek catching crawfish every day?" And, and like, I grew up in a suburb. It was like Dick's Sporting Goods, Applebee's, Chili's. It was like so copy and paste. It's the same as any other suburb in America. Like, if you've been to one, uh, you've been to all of them. I guess the main like thing that makes Madison unique is it gets made fun of by pretty much every other town in Mississippi. They call it a uh, brick city because they have like really strict building codes. And so it's all like, it's like any other suburb, but everything's just made out of like matching brick. So it's, it's a strange place. It's kind of like uh, the Truman show. That's pretty wild. Actually, the, like I grew up in something very similar. I always said like, if you go to, like my hometown and you go to like the suburbs, even out in Portland, like in Beaverton, or, you know, you wouldn't know. You'd be like, except we looked at all the hills. 
I our tour uh got snowed in. We missed six shows and I lived in Beaverton, Oregon for seven days. No way. Uh snowed in an Airbnb. So I oddly enough understand that reference very well. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so like what was was there a music scene there like did you grow up around music in that area like what was your like introduction to music uh my introduction to music was really uh, this is oddly specific but i remember when i was eight years old like there was a lot of cover bands uh lots of like restaurants with you know middle-aged band playing like steve miller that type of thing uh I remember being at Old Venice Pizza Company in Jackson, and it was Halloween, and they had a band that was dressed up as, like, Freddy Krueger, <laughs> and that's when I, like, started telling my parents, like, I want to play guitar. That was the sickest thing I've ever seen. I want to I wanna play the guitar. And, uh, How old were you? I was eight when oh, I yeah. first asked, and they, were, <laughs> they like, rented me a guitar because they didn't trust me to stick with it, and I think that was a good parent move because it, like, it's like I'll show them, you know. Made me, made me stick with it. And you just like immediately started kind of like noodling. Did you like start recording then too, or did you let that come a little later? I started recording later. I had a friend uh, who had a MacBook, and so I would go over to his house. I wasn't even really friends with this dude. I was just using him for his MacBook. Uh, I would play around on GarageBand. Uh, mm -hmm. This is when I was like 10, 11, and this dude would be like, "Come on, man, don't you want to like go outside or something?" Like, <laughs> Uh, and I just, uh, bugged my parents for a MacBook, but like, we couldn't afford one. Uh, I didn't get one until I went to college later on, but I would record stuff on my family's computer on like small softwares, uh, FL studios and stuff. Uh, around 15 is when I got into recording stuff and I immediately started posting stuff on SoundCloud and Bandcamp, mm. but I was like really secretive about it. Just, I don't know. That was just the type of thing I felt like you'd get bullied for as a kid. And now <laughs> exactly. I, it seems so goofy looking back. But... In the sap, maybe. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's hard to explain that to people that grew up in like somewhere uh, creative with a scene. But you get, yeah, you get called names for like singing and stuff. In some I know. Places. <laughs> I know. Actually, totally. Yeah, I, it's, I guess it's... there's so many things that are like different when the West or Northeast from. But when you started learning to like record, were you like picking up other instruments too? Were you doing all the instruments then, like drums, bass? Yeah, I've played guitar since eight, and then we had a piano in the house, so I fooled around on it and taught myself piano just based off what I knew from guitar. Uh, started playing drums around the same age. Mm -hmm. At that point, my parents kind of trusted me to stick with it, so they were like encouraging me to get into other instruments and stuff. And I was fortunate enough to, you know, be able to take guitar lessons and uh, kind of use that to figure out the other instruments. But yeah, I, I've always, it's, a, it's kind of been the only thing that, uh, it's been my main hobby pretty much my whole life. Been the main thing I'm okay at. Just is music. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Like, and so you started putting like music on SoundCloud, which is so weird to like think of, I mean, yeah, I don't know how much, do you put stuff on SoundCloud still? Is it kind of like that that day passed yeah i use soundcloud still uh i use it so like i'll put out an album and then there'll usually be a bunch of leftover songs or there'll be like demos that just mm -hmm. kind of hit a dead end i'll put those on soundcloud it's kind of how i differentiate like casual listeners to passionate listeners mm -hmm. you know if you really uh are a true fan you you know the soundcloud uh songs as well but I, I haven't been using it quite as much lately. You know, I've been working on a new album and I'm not really sure what's going to be included on it and not. And so it's, I've kind of taken a SoundCloud hiatus. But also, I feel like SoundCloud used to be a little better. I feel mm -hmm. like 2017, 2018 SoundCloud, the algorithm was so good. You could go on there, you could find a great song, you could click related tracks, and it mm -hmm. would just give you a list of like awesome songs from the most random people like mm -hmm. literally just some dude in philly with like a hundred followers yeah soundcloud would somehow know that you're gonna love that song uh it doesn't feel that way anymore like i like clicked related tracks the other day and it brought up the new little uzi vert record and that's <laughs> cool but not related <laughs> like <laughs> no and it's well it's, it's probably trying to make money right it's like suffering the same because it was like it was like that independent kind of music service out there that you could just not have a big label or no like backing and you could put stuff out. Right. Yeah. Honestly, SoundCloud needs to be funded by the government or something because it's not built to make money, but it's just too good of a thing to, to ruin. 
I know, because I mean, so many people were discovered and kind of like made music and posted cool stuff through that. Like I, uh, I love this guy Chances with Wolves. He's actually a DJ, and he just but he puts up all this crazy, weird, obscure music that he digs up. Uh, yeah, and you know stuff like that that just could never be on real like um, streaming services. Yeah, I came to really like SoundCloud. I realized that uh, if I posted like a song a week on there, mm-hmm. they kind of start to reward you back. You know, it, that they would start kind of algorithmically pushing it. And I started seeing my songs in like different radio stations and I was kind of excited, you know, even oh, though really? it's not monetized or anything. It's cool to see like, you know, click on an interwave song and they're like mm-hmm. recommending my song under it or something that that's like was really cool to me. And it's what made me eventually want to start posting on Spotify is I was like, you know, maybe maybe this uh, is something that works on other apps too. If you're just consistent enough. Yeah, and so you you started posting like 2014 under uh, Amateur Observer. Is that right? Is that the like the original band title? Yeah, I think that's around when I was doing Amateur Observer. I've had some projects I forgot the name of. <laughs> and I mean, you did that like, and then when it really started to change, like 2019, were you still putting on? T- on SoundCloud, or is that when you started putting it on, like, everywhere? January 2019 was the first Spotify release for me, and uh, I had been doing SoundCloud for a while, uh, having just fun with it, and for whatever reason, I still to this day don't really understand this type of person, but a lot of people will comment on SoundCloud and be like, please post this to Spotify, and I'm like, well, you're clearly listening to it here. Yeah. But I guess they would just rather have it on Spotify for whatever reason, I guess, to add it to playlists and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I would constantly get messages and comments and stuff. you like, put it on Spotify. And that just seemed so dumb to me at the time because I was like, this isn't a way to make money. Like, this isn't something I'm trying to monetize. Like, you know, and it's like you can't just go on Spotify.com and post stuff the way you can on SoundCloud. You got to go through a whole distributor. Mm-hmm. And I was in college at the time. I had other things to worry about. So, like, I just kind of put it off for the longest time. And then finally, January of 2019, I like uh, I had the idea of like taking some of the things uh, that I would have put on SoundCloud and put them on put them on Spotify and actually getting some good nice art for them and like kind of tying it together with a little bow to make it like more of an official thing. And yeah, I made a challenge to kind of post like an EP every other month or so. Cause like the thing about Spotify, if you're a new artist and you post a, an EP, like they can be like, oh, that's a good EP, but then they'll forget you exist in like one or two months. You have mm-hmm. to like constantly be doing stuff for like, the, beast. the streaming services to not forget you exist. So also, I'm just always making music too. So it's like, totally. there's no reason to be dramatic and like hold it back from people <laughs> and act like it's some commodity when you're like a new artist. Uh huh. And you were in school doing this. Like, what did you graduate for? What did you what what degree did you get? Uh, oddly enough, my degree is in uh, music business. Oh, cool. So you like thought you might yeah. be in the back end or something, or or actually for the for the recording. Yeah. yeah, that always felt safer to me. I was just like growing up. I I had the idea in my head that like you couldn't make a living as an artist, and that it, you know. I guess it was just like suburban upbringing type shit, but uh, I felt like I had to play it safe or something. Totally. And yeah, it, it wasn't until I realized that that's not true, uh, <laughs> like senior year of college, just in time. When you started, like, so you, in 2019, you put this out on Spotify in, through some independent, like was it like CD Baby or DistroKid or some? I was uh, using this website called Lander. Mm-hmm. Uh, cause it's like a mastering website. You mm-hmm. can put unmastered files and they'll like master them for you because I didn't know how to hell to master back then. Yep. And uh, they also uh, did distribution. So I already had an account with them. I just started uh, posting through Lander. And you released it to multiple platforms or just through Spotify? But somehow it also ended up on TikTok, right? Oh, yeah. I put it on everything. I mean, when you go through a distributor, uh, they typically put it on everything at once. You get the option. Yeah. yeah, I mean, certain distributors are better than others. I'm with Amuse now. I think they're the best. Mm -hmm. They actually let you, like, be really specific when you release music. Like, what portion of the song do you want to be the TikTok sound? Like, Mm. Lander didn't have all that. It was a lot more primitive back then. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah. Like what happens next? You you release it in what is it? What was it? January two thousand nineteen. Yeah, January twenty nineteen. Uh, I released the first project, and it got posted on different blogs and pages like Burp FM, uh, Blaylock's Indie Rock Playlist. Uh, it got put on uh David Dean Burkhart's YouTube. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
And it just got these like little bumps from things like that uh, and blog write-ups. I was going on submithub.com and I was like paying $1, $2 to submit the song to a playlist. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then a lot of times they'd just say no and they'd give you some bullshit reason why. Yeah. Uh, so I, I did that uh, for a while and it be kind of it was kind of like a version of gambling to me. Like I'd make a song mm-hmm. and then I'd go on submithub and like spend my money seeing if I could like get it playlisted or uh, in like a blog or whatever. And I don't know, after each month, you know, it would go up a little bit uh, until the point uh, after a year and a half or so, it was uh, like 100,000. Uh, and it got to 100,000, like completely organically just through Submit Hub. But then uh, the song went viral on TikTok and then it just started growing at like crazy rates. Uh, and I didn't even know what was going on for the first part of that because I didn't have TikTok on my phone. <laughs> you did that. That's the greatest part of that story is like, you just like, don't even know why. <laughs> yeah, it was probably viral on TikTok for like two weeks before I realized it. And I was just looking at Spotify for artists like, what is going on? This <laughs> is crazy. That is so awesome, right? It's just like, so you have a song, WK, WIM, like it's over yeah. like ha- half, a, half a billion. Is it already there? It's creeping up there. It's around like 490 or so. It's... I can't stop it. It won't stop. And it was like number one track in the world for a couple days. Is it that I? It was number one on the Billboard charts for one day, which is like my funniest uh, claim to fame. I don't know like did it feel strange like what was what was like going through you like yeah i felt like i was like with the make a wish foundation and they were like <laughs> being nice to me because i was about to die or some shit like i, I was like it's totally surreal this feels like everyone is like doing a bit or something this feels like everyone's messing with me like is this all like an ashton kutcher thing is he gonna pop out and be like ah. <laughs> yeah it didn't it didn't feel like anything I've ever experienced before to like have, have anything that I made get that much attention. And it wasn't even like negative attention or like embarrassing. It wasn't like people were doing some stupid dance or something to it. It was just getting used in like the most random ways. Yeah. Uh, and then you would think, oh, but does that translate to Spotify? And sure enough, it, it did. It's beyond me how all that works. Yeah. And it's such a cool story just because you're kind of like just just kind of grinding, hoping, and it's like hitting the lottery. But really, you know, it comes from like, like you were true to your passion of what you were doing. And it's, I mean, you like, you probably didn't have like the expectation that that would ever happen, right? Like, there's no way you could have. No, I I never thought I would get like 1 million streams. But I mean, I wasn't doing it for streams so much as, uh, I mean, I was kind of doing it for streams. It was fun to see the numbers go up. You oh, know? yeah, it's like the gambling part. Yeah, I didn't... It wasn't like I was making money off of it before. Like I would make like forty dollars a month from Spotify, and I would go to to like up and buy like a treat. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so I didn't really see it that way. But you did you like quit your job? Like what did you do when this happened? I uh was waiting tables at the time, so I absolutely quit that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh yeah, that was the last job I had. And were you were you in still in Mississippi? No, were you in Nashville at that time? Yeah, this is when I. I lived in Hattiesburg, Mississippi at the time. That's where I went to college. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's where the University of Southern Mississippi is. Yep. Uh, I was a- about to graduate. I think I had just graduated when it was like popping off, but I still had six months on my lease. Mm-hmm. And so for six months, uh, I was just living in this house and like getting ready, like getting my resume ready, doing job research, still thinking that I was uh, going to get like a job. And then it wasn't until... Uh, I like accepted a deal and had a manager all of a sudden and they got explained to me like, no, like you're, you're good. You don't need to do anything except for this. Is it a record deal or a management deal? Did you, did you do? I got a, um, essentially a record deal from this, uh, company amuse. Mm. Uh, they gave me, well, it's a licensing deal since it's a song that's already out. But then they asked me like, do you have any new music? Do you have any unreleased stuff? And Mm -hmm. I sent that to them uh right after i signed with them and they immediately sent a second deal which was a record deal uh for that album and that was off the grid so i've done like two deals with the muse um which has helped out a lot like i love that company they've been so good to me and they're like a really healthy company right now signing lots of other artists and Mm -hmm. i get 
messages from artists like every single week like hey how's your experience with the muse i just got an offer from them so i i love working with them are they like a typical record label or because i've not really heard as much about them no uh they were a distribution company similar mm-hmm. to like cd baby and all of those mm-hmm. uh and they got popular doing that they made a lot of money as a company doing that and so they decided to branch out and start giving like label style deals like in advance plus a time period mm-hmm. and uh it's worked out really well. Apparently they have some money to work with. Cause I know like, I have like five friends at least that have gotten deals from Amuse and some have taken and some haven't, but, uh, they're, they're doing well. And they're, I love the people that work for them. And they're always like a text away, even though they're mostly located in London and Sweden. Mm-hmm. So it's like, it's pretty much all you can ask for from a label. You know, the worst fear is like signing with a, a Capitol records and then realizing that, no one at that label actually gives a shit about you because like they also have Lil, Lil Nas X signed. And you also like, I mean, did you get to keep your masters? Or was that like part of like, is it a different type of record? Is it a more modern record label deal? Yeah. These are a lot more friendly terms. Like uh, when labels first started reaching out to me, uh, the norm was 25 year licensing. They wanted uh, to basically like own uh, my music for 25 years mm-hmm. uh, in exchange for one amount of money exactly. just up front. It's just crazy. Uh, Amuse always does like five year deals. So right. it's way different and generally more money than what the major labels are offering to. I would be very weary if I was anybody trying to accept a major label deal, unless you've already been famous for years and have already achieved like longevity. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I would be very careful. It's super tempting, right? Like, I mean, all of those things sound like when you're working in a restaurant or whatever, and you're just like, you want to get a different life, right? Like if people kind of like get seduced into that, like they're going to be taken care of, but the next thing they know, they're like, they're not really making the money off their own stuff. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Cause yeah, they'll, they'll email people and just be like, Hey, do you want eight hundred thousand dollars? And of course, any sane persons can be like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Not realizing it's about to like ruin their entire life. <laughs> I know. That's a, that's like right. one of those really hard choices. So like, you got a song just going super big, right? And you're like, God, is this gonna? Ha- do I get this chance again? Is this gonna happen? Right? It's like a nutty. You also think it's gonna end at any second. Like yeah. two weeks in, I was like, oh, it's gonna start going back down to normal. But no, nah, I. It goes to show, I don't know how any of this shit works. <laughs> I'm along for the ride. Uh, yeah, just taking it day by day. And I mean, and you basically, yeah, you basically got to this place where you're able to still kind of be creatively. You're not indebted to have to like kick out six more records or anything. It's on your own timetable, right? Like everything is yours. Pretty much. But I do try to rapid fire a little bit. Cause well, I mean, like, that's, but that's your choice, bottom, right? That's like your choice. Yeah. When I first started the project, I was like, I want to make music for me. I just want to be selfish about it and make music, songs that I would like. Because mm-hmm. there's lots and lots and lots of other people out there like me. So if I just think, like, what melody do I want to hear? What tempo do I want this to be? Just, like, be selfish about every decision. It's going to... There's a lot of people out there that are going to hear it and be like, I feel like this was made just for me. I feel like, uh, you yeah. know, this is exactly what's in my head. And, uh, and so since i'm making music just for me i'm very adhd i get distracted really easily so if i was releasing music for myself i would have to be sure to keep it coming Mm -hmm. uh you know so i'm just trying to serve other people with uh my type of brain i guess (laughs) it's cool though like i mean i i always say something selfish but another way like you're just being you're just like following your own passion you know what i mean it's just like this is what you want to do like kind of thing and it's like cool that it works out. And since then you've had like, you know, over 12 singles, over 80 APs, full length record coming, working on one. Right. Is that, that you just, yeah. you're just like, that's, that's what you mean. You've just been since 2000, since 2000, like 2019, that's all been happening. Right. That's about, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Just nonstop. And you, yeah, you moved to Cove in COVID times to Nashville. How did that, kind of influence you when you were there uh it was fun honestly living there there was a lot that was fun about it i was uh dating somebody at the time that got a job in nashville so that was like the predominant reason for the move and obviously with it being music city uh i was fine with it because i was like i'm sure there'll be plenty of music and you know 
uh stuff to mm-hmm. do and there there was like there's a great underlying music scene in nashville like other than the the obvious country when uh there's a great punk scene there's a great hardcore scene mm-hmm. i started going to different types of shows that i've honestly never uh been to too often and uh started making lots of friends within the scene and it's like really close knit and it's really loving and uh i miss those people like it's a unique aesthetic but the city uh kind of has the vibe of being like under attack by just uh investors and tourists i mean we lost probably like four music venues in the two years that i was there like legendary music videos like exit in for example like wow uh and you know most of this shit gets torn down to build airbnbs or like a honky-tonk bar so it's a little bit disheartening to live there as like uh if you're an east nashville person if you're in like the more underground scene i get yeah it's kind of it's kind of hard to watch uh and I didn't really feel like married to the city or anything because I didn't grow up there. So once I got uh, out of that relationship, I I got out. <laughs> and how's New York? What's New York like? New York is just like a big playground for adults. I I love it. It's really fun. I uh, I'm not like naive. I don't think that I'm meant to be here forever, but I definitely like you know popping off here for now. And uh, I don't know. I'm always like planning what the next step is going to be though. I've been looking upstate too, and I really like that. I I just. I love New York. I was just in London for like a month and a half. Uh, and the whole time I was there, I was just like, I want to go back to New York. That's cool. You kind of like, and then the, there's so much music there, right? There's just so much happening and uh, on all kinds of levels, big, small. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Every music scene. Absolutely. And it's like, I have a lot of friends here too. So like when I was in Nashville, uh, I, you know, I had a lot of friends in New York and I was constantly seeing what they were up to and it always looked like so much fun. And so I, I kind of felt, found myself having lots of FOMO mm-hmm. and I guess, it, yeah, it just kind of occurred to me, like, I guess I could just live there. Totally. Are you finding like, is like the, there's a, there's a lot, there's a whole different type of music industry there in New York. Like, are you kind of getting courted? Like, are there all these conversations like Ryan? let's let's go out to lunch yeah that's something i'm not used to it's like i'm always just like i can't take compliments that's one bad thing about me and then like uh, when you're put in a situation with lots of disingenuine comment compliments Mm -hmm. it's just like and you're self-aware of how disingenuine it is it's it's kind of exhausting like i went to some like music event uh that my manager told me about the other week and it was all like people that work in the industry and they're all just like kind of kissing each other's ass that type of vibe and mm-hmm. let's just say i was abusing the open bar that they had for us because that shit was painful <laughs> to me it's hustling you know like i some i have a little sympathy because i bet you in that mix like they're they're like trying to figure out how to like be successful right like and yeah. and so you're there <laughs> trying to like impart wisdom on people right like tell us <laughs> yeah this yeah it, it's like I get put in uncomfortable situations every now and then with like people I don't really know just being like, yeah, we should uh, collab sometimes or you should remix our song sometimes. Let me send you these stems so you can remix this. I don't know. Like, it's not like everything I touch is going to go viral on TikTok. It's just like one song. (laughs) And it's more than one song. There's like a bunch of songs on there that are in the tens of millions. So that's pretty good, too. (laughs) Yeah. Like most artists, if somebody had like tens of millions, they'd be like stoked. It's a challenge, though, because uh, the Internet obviously moves a lot faster than real life. And so just because you like mm-hmm. have this project that shoots its way up to seven million monthly listeners in less than a year, it doesn't mean that you're all of a sudden able to play stadiums and like sell out huge arenas. Like it takes time for that stuff to happen in real life. Uh, and it takes a lot of work for that stuff to yeah. happen. So let's talk about that. Cause- yeah. Is that, yeah, that's like, that's, I was going to just ask you, like, when you have that kind of base, this other opportunity of kind of like live performance and, you know, what, how are you thinking about that? Like, are you trying to make a band? Is that, I mean, you've done a lot of solo performances, but what's your thoughts on like making this a live thing? So most of the songs I, I made during COVID and I wasn't even thinking about the live performance aspect of it. It's something I didn't think about until more recently, but, um, when you hear a sound on the internet when you hear a song on the internet you don't necessarily think like oh this is an indie rock band that goes on tour it's just like no this is like a popular sound that people are using 
So the goal is to mm -hmm. like uh, make awareness go from zero, you know, just like, oh, I like this sound on TikTok to, oh, no, I like this guy and he makes other songs and he plays, uh, you know, I want it there to be some recognition name to face. I want to like travel, meet as many oh. people, play as many shows as possible and just like pedal to the floor, do as much as I can. Yeah, obviously it's my own project. I do everything alone. Uh, and I do like playing solo shows. I like playing stripped versions of the songs for people. But ultimately, I love playing in a band. I love having a drummer and a bass player and a keyboard. Uh, it allows me to like play the songs differently than the studio version. It allows me to like put some more energy into it, make songs that wouldn't normally mm -hmm. make people dance, you know, make people move around. It's just more fun. It's more interactive. It's also a lot more expensive. And that's one reason that like when I go over to Europe uh, <laughs> and play like six different countries, I can't bring drums and bass and all that not yet not yet no you have to you got to put in your time you got to do your penance first and that's what i'm working on right now is i'm playing all these solo shows really <laughs> as long as we're in america though i'm bringing the band yeah so when you come to pickathon what do, who's going to be in the band this year well we'll see about that one actually that might be a, that might be a solo show just because it's a, a small a smaller festival and i know i got to go from pickathon to like la for like a writer's camp after that I got to talk to my management about that. I'd love to bring the band. You should, because Pickathon is a festival where you'll explode. Yeah, y'all have a crazy track record for that. Yeah, and and there are countless bands that go from there to like Red Rocks within a year, but it's all, there's tons of national press. We've seen this like constantly. Like I think that, that yeah, that live kind of band energy of kind of making what's, works so well on the on the spotify like if you can bring that translate that which you already can because you're playing it live you're feeling it is already you it's not a long distance if you can kind of tie the two together and really find that unit you click with yeah totally a, a lot of the hard work has been done for sure and uh i have a, a, a few tours under my belt now with the band so it's like nice to have that comfort of knowing that it does work and it can work we hope you we hope you do i mean whatever you want to bring is going to be awesome so um just that picket done is kind of like last year we had a band who was just just growing up kind of in a different world but he was like internet famous too like goth babe i don't know if you know goth babe i do know yeah he's from, was there. he's from around nashville I've never met him, but we we know a lot of the same people. Yeah, he lived up in north northwest a long long time. He was up up living in kind of right outside of in Washington in a and kind of in a sailboat in different weird places, but just kind of connected to us. He's been coming to Pickathon for a while, like just actually not even playing. He's just been coming. He just literally, you know, played and boom, he said Red Rocks. Uh, Billy Strings is another one, like a weird Nashville bluegrass band, right? And now he's yeah. playing the Moda Center in Portland. It's not, it, it, it goes fast. And so it's like the, the tricky part, you know, and I, I can tell it's in you is like keeping yourself, you know, like when things go that fast, it's, there's so many temptations like, hey, we'll buy you or like, why don't you do pick us on in 20 cities, right? Like kind of thing, <laughs> <laughs> merchandise yeah. it and it's just hard like when things move so fast, but it's it's cool. I mean, it's really unique, cool opportunity you have. It's so cool. It's really cool. I'm just trying to make the mess, most of it and not like, you know, fuck it up. <laughs> You're not going to fuck it up. You're I can tell like you you made choices that I mean, you could have made different choices to be try even be on a faster lane, right? It could have had bad repercussions for your independence, you know, like it's and this is just me like going through 24 years of like trying to like, you know, grow something like Pickathon and Independent Festival and just, it doesn't, you know, in so many ways along there, we made choices that maybe we would, we went slower, but I mean, we're really happy. Like we have something that it's, is. Yeah. It's very impressive. Uh, you know, I, I went to school with a lot of people in my major that were like, yeah, dude, I'm going to I'm going to do a Mississippi music festival and it's going to be huge. And then you watch them slowly realize how much work goes into it. And they're like, wait, what do you mean? We need electricity. We need bathrooms. We need <laughs> like it all just like slowly hits them uh, how how hard that actually is to do. So 
respect. Yeah. And yeah, I think the slow grow is the best thing. If if stuff blows up in your face and goes bigger, you know, faster than you expected, that's a challenge in of its own because you got to worry about longevity and you got to worry about people forgetting you exist. So I like a nice slow build. I'm patient. I can wait it out. You know, right on. And I'm stoked that actually, you know, the coolest thing is that uh, you're camping here with us, <laughs> which is awesome. Oh, really? Well, we have this deluxe thing. So we set up stuff in like, you won't understand Pendarvis Farm till you come, but you might, I mean, you could also stay there, but at some point your, your, uh, your manager thought you wanted to camp and we had set you up with like our artist camping. I don't know if you've ever, do you camp at all? I, I can't. Uh, uh, that's not, I shouldn't call this camping. I, no, I never camp. I went camping, camping like a couple weeks ago on Rockaway beach, but it was an Airbnb and it was like one of those fire fest tents that they had. <laughs> oh my but, God. Yeah. But it was like already set up for me and stuff when I showed up. <laughs> so I, a lot of the work was erased. There's no work. And you, that's but, what I'm talking about. And if it's not fun, you don't have to do it, but you have your own like private living room. There's this little place called the Pump House in the, and the right there, and there's just it's kind of like a fantasy island. You'll be fine. You'll be, <laughs> it's going to be a good thing. <laughs> hey, well, thank you for for being my guest today, and we're really kind of I'm I'm a big fan and really stoked the way you're doing it and how you're going at it, and just want to kind of like just give you props, man, for thank for you. staying in that staying in your kind of head and not like you know, not getting too stressed about it or, you know, and just, just dealing with the good things that are coming your way. So I appreciate you uh, having me here and I appreciate you having me at Pickathon. I'm really looking forward to the right on. I just found out about the camping, so I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> you can, we can talk more, but uh, if you're into it, like we're into it, it's going to be awesome. And like, I'll, we'll hang out right when you get there and Hell yeah. it's going to be, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be our best year ever. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye, everyone. This has been a great episode with Ryan and end of uh, episode 12. And we'll be next, next week with episode 13. Peace. Bye, y'all. You've been listening to the Pickathon Podcast. This podcast is produced by Zale Schoenborn, Tanner McCullough, and Evan Throckman. The music in this episode was by our guest of honor, Yacht Club. The songs included were Down Bad, No Way, YKWIM, and the one we're riding out on right now, Japan. Thank you to the whole Pickathon family. And like Zale said, catch you all next week.